Hello, I'm David Marler from Rotterdam UAS, and welcome to this webinar on the British monarchy for the course Culture and Literature II, British Culture and Literature. The objectives of this course are that you'll be able to explain the role of the monarchy in present-day British society. And you can also list the most prominent members of the royal family and explain their relation to each other. The topics that we're going to cover today are the House of Windsor, power on paper versus power in reality, the different roles of the monarch, the value of the monarch, and the future of the monarchy. In order to understand the House of Windsor, we have to go back to Queen Victoria. Queen Victoria became queen after her uncles died. Her uncle, the Duke of York, died first, leaving the throne to his brother, George IV, who died in 1830. This meant that her father became the heir to the throne. He had one daughter, Victoria, who essentially became the queen. Victoria was from the House of Hanover, a German house. When she married a cousin, Albert, from the House of Saxe Coburg and Gotha, she took his last name and her son and grandson became members of the House of Saxe Coburg and Gotha. The House of Windsor came into being in 1917 when the name was adopted as the British royal family's official name by proclamation of King George V, replacing the historic name of Saxe Coburg Gotha. It remains the name of the current royal family. George V is Elizabeth II's grandfather. The king and his family were persuaded to abandon all their titles to the German crown and to change their German titles and their German last names to anglicized forms. That's why they chose the name Windsor, essentially a made-up name. Now, when we look at the modern mar monarchy, we can see that there's the rule versus the reality. And we call this the power on paper versus the power in reality. From the evidence of written law only, the queen has almost absolute power, and it almost seems very undemocratic. Every fall, for instance, at the opening of Parliament, Queen Elizabeth II makes a speech. She has, as it appears, almost absolute power to name members of the cabinet, including the prime minister and all of the ministers and secretaries. But this shows the difference in the, one of the issues with the Constitution. In reality, she has no power at all. When she opens Parliament every year, the speech she makes has been written for her. She does not name the prime minister. He or she is chosen by the people and the political parties. She does summon and dissolve parliament, but always at the request of the political parties that are in charge. When we look at the monarchy, we can say that the modern monarch has three main roles. First, the monarch is the personal embodiment of the government and of the country. This is very symbolic. This means that people can be nasty or have really kind of bad thoughts about the actual government in power, the prime minister, the parliament, the cabinet, but they still have a head of state that they can look up to. The second is that the monarch is essential type of final check on the government becoming dictatorial. One of the arguments that a lot of people have made is that the situation that happened in Nazi Germany in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s would have been impossible in the UK because the queen in the end, can still, if she wishes, based on what's in the Constitution, actually reject laws. The third is that the monarch has a very practical role to play. Being the figurehead and representative of the country, Queen Elizabeth can perform the, cesar the ceremonial duties of the head of state. So when foreign leaders arrive, etc., the prime minister is often there, but that's really the job of the queen. When new railway tracks are open, stadiums, etc., it's the queen or the monarch who does this job. And when we look at the British monarchy, we can actually see that it probably has a much greater value economically than it does to as a, as a form of functioning government. Tourist brochures for Britain usually give the great prominence to the monarchy. It's impossible to estimate exactly how much the British royal family and the events and buildings associated with the monarchy help the tourist industry or British industry in general, but we can assume that they help out quite a bit. A lot of, for instance, whiskey brands, cookies, uh, various things are royal, and this, of course, makes this is all associated with the popularity of the British monarchy. Still, it has to be said that the royal family is super wealthy, and yet they still cost the British taxpayers a large amount of money. 
as you can see here, from 2012 to 2019, the British monarchy is costing the British people more and more every year. At the same time, they're one of the wealthiest families in the world, and a majority of the wealth that they've amassed has come from things that have been purchased by the people or with taxpayer money in the past. So there is an ethical question that has to be asked that a lot of Republicans or people that are against the monarchy often bring up. The next part that we want to discuss is, of course, what the future is of the monarchy. There is much debate about what kind of monarchy Britain should have. During the last two decades of the 20th century, there was a general cooling of enthusiasm. The queen herself remained popular, but there were a lot of problems within the royal family that often upset the British people. With the death of Diana, people thought that the monarchy was an old institution and that it was very much out of touch with the general people of Britain. However, the monarchy, and especially Diana's children, uh, William and Harry, have made the monarchy really popular again. But the monarchy is still to this day one of the most hotly debated topics in the British media, and specifically in the tabloids, the, the gossip press. What we're going to look at today for the activity is, of course, the media and the monarchy. And we're going to see how the media has portrayed the differences between uh, Diana's two children and their wives, specifically William with Kate and Harry with Meghan. And we're going to start off by talking about an avocado. Recently, an article came out that said, uh, that was talking about Meghan, who, of course, while being pregnant, uh, loved to snack on avocados. And in the Times, a very large article came up, is Meghan's favorite snack fueling drought and murder with the question mark? And of course, you then have uh, a small picture, as you can see on the left, of, uh, of Meghan, and you have the food. But then the much larger picture is, of course, a man with a bulletproof vest and an automatic weapon wearing a mask and a helmet. And for a lot of people, Meghan has been kind of the person to pick on in the royal family. And there's even been a website where they will look at, for instance, one topic, for instance, this avocado, and they will compare it to how the same topic was dealt with with Prince William's wife, Kate, the future queen. We can see this here. So for instance, on the left, the Express wrote, Meghan Markle's beloved avocado linked to human rights abuse and drought millennial shame. Um, and then at the same time, bizarrely enough, uh, Prince William's wife, uh, Kate, also loved the avocado when she was pregnant. And there the title was Kate's Morning Sickness Cure, Prince William gifted with avocado for gifted with an avocado for pregnant duchess. Very similarly, this is a very common aspect of the way that the two, uh, the two women are dealt with in the media, often from the same newspaper. Here we have the Daily Mail, where we have Kate, not long to go pregnant, Kate tenderly cradles her baby bump while wrapping her royal duties ahead of maternity leave, and William confirms she's due any minute now, compared to Meghan. Why can't Meghan Markle keep her hands off her bump? Experts tackle the question that has got the nation talking. Is it pride, vanity, acting, or a new age of bonding, or a new age bonding technique? Now, this is very interesting because for uh, a, a lot of older British people, they see Meghan as being this kind of very negative person. Uh, they see her as changing Harry, making him very anti-monarchy, and they really do love Kate. For a lot of the young people, they actually think that, uh, you know, they don't understand why the, the press is being so negative towards Meghan Markle. So for this week's activity on Moodle, you're going to read two articles, um, both with the same topic, and you're going to answer the following two questions. How is the media treated William and Kate uh, versus Harry and Meghan? And you're going to use specifics. So you're going to use specific language from each text. Then your next one is going to be, why do you think that Meghan and Harry have been treated differently? So you're going to read the two articles and you're going to prepare a very short essay explaining how the media has treated the two families and why do you think that that is the case. And this is what we are going to discuss in today's class online on 
the monarchy. And I'd like to thank you for listening and hope to see you soon.